Hi, everybody, and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Uh, I'm Father Tony Sylvia, and joining me once again, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. So we've got a great topic tonight. We're going to do another uh, quick little mini-sode to fill in the gaps in our schedule for the holidays. Um, and to help us do that, we have Scott Smith, author of God Reconsidered, Searching for Truth in the Battle Between Atheism and Religion. Welcome, Scott, and thanks for being on the show. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. I um, was delighted to find out about you guys. Yeah, no, and uh, we've uh, we've heard you uh, interviewed on other shows, uh, of, of course, uh, Aeon Byte and others. So uh, we're we're glad to get you on ours. Okay, so, so we'll uh, we'll plow ahead with all danger noted. Here. <laughs> <laughs> You've been warned, everybody. All right. Yep. So, um, what made you decide to write a book about uh, about this topic, and um, what was your religious background going into this? Well. As I understand it, we don't have 24 hours to cover that topic <laughs> adequately. So let, let me give you the short version, which is still very long-winded. Um, the, the essence of how I came to write this book um, is rooted in my background because I was very fortunate to grow up in the 1950s and 60s in suburban LA in a Mormon family. So it was like Leave it to Beaver meets Ozzy and Harriet. And Mormon families are famous for supporting their kids, and they told me I could be anything. And so I was kind of an overachieving Boy Scout, and everything was really pretty normal until I was 17. And I had my first religious crisis and experience with synchronicity in that uh, somebody mailed me a brochure about animal cruelty and religion and I had never heard this discussed among the Mormons and I immediately realized that any religion that did not address this issue could not be a true religion and I think most people know Mormons are very convinced that they have the true religion and um, Harold Bloom and others have noted that it has a lot of parallels with Gnosticism and uh, it was quite ordinary for us to hear stories from people who had encounters with the spirits. And, uh, you know, Mormonism is very much a living religion. Uh, it's not about what happened 2,000 years ago. And uh, so this was the first time that I had um, my faith shaken. But as it happened, um, this really opened up an incredible learning experience about Mormonism where I discovered it has the most sophisticated uh, animal rights theology of any Christian religion. And this led to a career uh, I founded, Vegetarian World, which I sold to Vegetarian Times and um, published several books on the subject, uh, which are still sold by Amazon. And I went on to become a kind of Mormon scholar and defender of the faith and all this stuff. And everything was more or less fine again until uh, 1989. And um, I had been, um, you know, fighting off the usual skeptics, the uh, evangelicals and, and other people who don't understand the Bible. And um, But just as kind of a recreational thing on the side, I decided to look into UFO abductions, which in the late 80s were a thing, and I thought it would be kind of interesting. I didn't think I would learn anything. And I quickly fell into the abyss uh, of realizing that um, the cosmos was really a hall of mirrors where it's very hard to know the truth, and um, it put me into a tremendous crisis. I had just gone through the landmark forum, which used to be called S, and I had gone up to um, uh, Esalen Institute and took a course with Michael Murphy and George Leonard and so forth and so on. And um, for a variety of reasons, um, one morning, uh, I was deep in prayer, and I was given a direct knowledge for about two hours, a mystical experience of the great lie, as I call it, at the basis of all religions east and west, which is that the gods have put us here on earth so that we can fulfill our destiny, obeying 
their commands and, you know, or trying to amass good karma so that we'll come back, uh, you know, in a better life and make progress and all this kind of stuff. And um, this was a big shock and I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how it fit in with the religions of the world. I'd never really considered this before. And um, I went on um, a kind of a, a voyage of discovery. I uh, began uh, right around that time by a strange coincidence. My son, who my, my first wife and I had been uh, divorced for many years, and they just happened, she and my son just happened to visit me on Father's Day in 1990 when I was scheduled to interview Scott Rogo, who I regard as the greatest uh, parapsychologist ever, and I'd read a bunch of his books. I thought he was the only objective guy writing about the paranormal, and I sat down for the only really thorough interview he'd ever done on everything you can imagine. <laughs> and we wrapped it up, and uh, I went on vacation and came back and found out he'd been murdered. <laughs> and this began, I sold the interview with him to Fate Magazine, and this began a long period of time of reporting on the paranormal. My um, new wife, who was then my girlfriend, joined me. Um, we had chances to interview and have experiences with Ori Geller and James Van Prague and a bunch of other really, really interesting people. We went to Ireland to write about people who see fairies, and uh, I got to, I wrote a lot of about UFOs uh, for UFO magazine and a bunch of other stuff. And um, we've traveled the world uh, to India, Egypt. Uh, we've participated in Santeria ceremonies, Jain temple ceremonies, all kinds of stuff. And all along the way, I'm asking people questions about what is the truth? You know, why is there so much confusion? Why are the spirits saying one thing here and one thing there? You know, the Virgin Mary appears to say, the Catholics have it. And then, you know, um, the angel Gabriel uh, comes down to reveal um, the fact that Muhammad is the last prophet. And I we spent a week in Saudi Arabia, of all things. and. So we've had a chance to really kind of sample the truth. It was not until 2005 when there was an article about LA Weekly on Stefan Heller and Ecclesia Gnostica that I suddenly realized what that 1989 experience was about. And the pieces suddenly came together. And he's been my mentor. He's an extraordinary person. He's working on his autobiography, incidentally. I keep bugging him about it. And I say, you can't die until you finish this. So just maybe maybe that, I don't know if that's really a threat or maybe it's a key to immortality. But anyway, um, so right early on, I conferred with him. He had been up to the Mormon conference, the Sunstone Symposium. Uh, he and Dr. Lance Owens, you guys probably know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and they talked about Gnosticism and Mormonism. And, and I did the same thing in 2006. I hadn't been to the Sunstone Symposium in about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. So I came back, told them about Gnosticism and where they'd gone wrong and where they were right and had a lot of similarities. And um, and then, for a variety of reasons, I decided to write a book to kind of fill a gap that I saw, which was that as a journalist, and believe it or not, I've written about things other than the fairies and UFO abductions, I had uh, segued uh, in the 2000s into, <laughs> oddly enough, a, a career writing about um, and interviewing top CEOs. I've interviewed Bill Gates and Meg Whitman and Richard Branson and you know just about anybody you can think of. Very worldly stuff and I thought I would take that kind of very worldly, mundane, logical, business-like, analytical approach to the supernatural and religion. And um, so I, uh, I decided to um, just write it out and see what happened and um, eventually a publisher offered me a deal and that's how the thing got out there but I mean I could write a book about what happened impeding the book you know uh, 
So that's my very, very long-winded way of saying that I feel I've got a mission to kind of contribute to the conversation about religion and Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. So uh, Do we have any time left to talk about anything else now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, why, why reconsider God then? Yeah. Um, what I wanted to do um, was say, you know, all these arguments about does God exist and evidence and so forth, they're really missing the issue because as far as anybody can tell, um, nobody is really going to be able to prove God to non-believers. That's a matter of mystical experience. I've had a number of experiences, and I will say God exists, and defining that, we can get into a discussion. But, um, but I wanted to basically say the debate should not really be about does God exist. The mystics know a God exists. Um, the problem is that modern atheists have gotten off track here. Um, they are not skeptics in the sense of wanting to know what the truth is. They are militant debunkers who are as close-minded as the evangelicals are. So I wanted to go down that middle path and say there are many things that we can look at that open the door to God by showing there is another dimension. I mean, I always find it incredible that the so-called skeptics are perfectly willing to jump on a theory like the ten-string multiverse, but they absolutely know there couldn't possibly be, you know, another dimension, you know. And um, a lot of the stuff, ironically enough, um, you can look at things that are so-called supernatural, and there's a lot of very good evidence for them. So I'm trying to open up the conversation, and God reconsidered is my Trojan horse to get people's attention and say the conversation really here isn't about God because we're mortals. Let's talk about what we can know, which is the greater reality beyond our little daily trivia and Twitter feed and everything, you know. So I wanted to kind of divert the conversation to the next level, which is, is there any evidence for things that the materialists deny exist? Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please. Uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. And, uh, and did you find uh, uh, such evidence, you know, uh, stuff like 
ghost spirits, ESP, near-death experiences. I mean, I can see how these can fit into a religious worldview, but is there proof for such things? I, amazingly enough, there is a tremendous amount of both scientific and what you can call logic or lawyerly evidence, which is the approach that I'm using, uh, for many things. And um, I thought I would take three of the, the ones that I knew would really, really upset and annoy the skeptics, because I've been dealing with them for 30 years. Um, and I find it amusing that these people who think of themselves as very rational get totally irrational when you try to discuss any of these subjects. Um, I opened the book with something on ESP because I had a chance to do a very extensive interview with Dr. Dean Radin, who uh, was the author of The Conscious Universe, which is a, a really, really brilliant book by a hands-on investigator of ESP. And um, what happened to him in the wake of the book, the hysterical reaction from the uh, so-called scientific community to the notion that there's ESP is a story unto itself, and I've written about it. Uh, and I recount some of this in this first chapter. The funny thing about it is, um, you know, a, 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 an atheist and a materialist like Sigmund Freud accepted ESP because he had so many telepathic experiences with his patients that it was just a thing. It was a natural thing, part of reality, you know. But these guys, after, this is their Achilles heel because there's so much evidence for ESP that I really wanted to drive it home. And, and I've driven them really crazy on, on secular Facebook pages. I, I end up getting banned after a while because I know, and you can go on to UFOs and you can go on to afterlife and so forth. And there really is an amazing amount of experience and it's amounting all the time. So. Um, th this is where I'm trying to direct the conversation. Why don't we have discussions about these things and put some parameters around them and figure out how we can eliminate, eliminate the superstition and the new age crap and so forth. And so that's kind of part of the, uh, the mission that I feel I have. So you mentioned uh, uh, Bishop Heller and uh, the Ecclesia Gnosica. Uh, we've had him on the, the show before, and, and of course, this is a, a Gnosticism podcast. So where where does your research and your experiences line up with Gnostic thought, both ancient Gnostic thought and, and modern? Well, uh, the, you know, by and large, uh, I would say that um, I agree with the big picture. I'm I think I'm making a contribution to the conversation in a number of ways. Um, first of all. I think we all realize, you know, uh, there's very little dogma. Uh, you have to define Gnosticism very broadly. And I think too many people, you know, get very uptight. Oh, there's no such thing as Gnosticism and so forth. Um, I would even kind of slightly challenge the concept of Gnosis in saying that I think what's really important is that whether you have a sudden illumination like I did or whether you slowly come to the point through study and other experiences where the veil drops from your eyes and you realize that this world could not have been the design of a benevolent creator. Now, we can differ on the details of, oh, was this world created by a god, or, you know, uh, what is the purpose of life, and things like that. But that, what I would call the ultimate dualism, the um, differentiates Gnosticism from all the other fairy tales that want to say we're here for a purpose. Everything is meant to be. God has absolute foreknowledge and, you know, the things that happen to us, we may not understand them now, but we'll understand them eventually or it's all karma or all this kind of stuff. Uh, I am the skunk at the party with regard to all this stuff. I think if you really want to know the truth, you have to first embrace the, the Gnostic insight that this world is an accident. And yes, there are miracles. There's divine intervention. That doesn't mean you can't have a purposeful life and a spiritual life. <clears throat> but if you start with the fairy tale that 
you know, the bad things that happened to you are, you know, all the Jews were killed in the Holocaust because they did something terrible. You know, it, this notion that, um, you know, God is watching over us and, um, you know, our job is to kind of find out, you know, what he wants of us, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then, then you're off on the wrong direction, you know. So I want to, basically, I'm in agreement with the fundamental insight and I do believe it counts for a lot to see that we've been deceived and that we're being manipulated and then we can get into the conversation about you know what it all means why don't uh, why doesn't god intervene more why aren't you know our prayers answered more and stuff like that which are fascinating topics but um and and my attitude is we don't have to know everything i do think we can know some things through reason and illumination and study and the conversations i've had with um, audiences and readers and stuff like that. I mean, I've been evolving my ideas, but um, Gnosticism is the only spiritual path beyond a kind of vague shamanism that um, is on the right track. And, and I can say that as somebody who has studied virtually all religions uh, traveling the world and academically and, you know, interviewing the mystics and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Where does some of your um, your research and your experiences and, and thoughts sort of diverge from Gnosticism? Well, <clears throat> I am a heretic among heretics on, on some things. Um, the uh, it would it would take a whole show to kind of go through that. And and if you go on um, Aeon Bytes comment section, <laughs> I I think it's probably true that. Per episode, I have more back and forth with the viewers than uh, most of the guests because, um, you know, a lot of people come to the subjects that I expound on without having my background. Um, to just pick on one very, very, very touchy subject, reincarnation. Um, I'm not going to persuade anybody in the one minute we cover it here that I know what I'm talking about, but I do have two chapters on this, the Buddhist version and the Hindu version. Surprisingly enough, um, Madame Blavatsky, who pretty much popularized belief in the Hindu version of reincarnation, uh, Heller recently revealed, and he did a series of lectures on my book and talked about this, and he said, some secret letters were found by her, you know, after her death, where she revealed that she thought very few people reincarnated, and if so, it wasn't because of karma, it was because of attachment. And Gila Quispel, the translator of the Nagamati text, said that um, reincarnation might happen from time to time, but it had nothing to do with karma. And I take those points and elaborate on a book that Scott Rogo wrote called The Search for Yesterday, where he shows that most of the so-called reincarnation memories are easily debunked. And people think, oh, there's this massive amount of evidence. Have you never heard of, you know, this guy and that guy? Yeah, I have. I've read all this stuff. I'm very familiar with it. Um, so what I would say is, you know, it's not a dogma. Yes, the Manichaeans and the Cathars believed in reincarnation. They were also vegetarian. Well, I started a vegetarian magazine. I'm a big fan of the diet. Uh, but, you know, they, you know, I don't think most Gnostics would, certainly not Stefan Heller, uh, uh, would embrace that idea. So, no, we don't have to go along with every idea that some of our fellow Gnostics embraced. I would simply say this, I am absolutely sure that we die once, and I think Heller agrees with me that we, uh, what happens after death is we uh, go into different um, dimensions of consciousness. Reincarnating, and this is something that I think most Gnostics don't really understand, reincarnating uh, multiplies the original mistake anybody you know the, the whole 60s thing about the new age thing of oh we will come back and then we will re-embody for a new opportunity to uh, learn and spiritually advance 
No, you won't. You will be born in Africa, you know, and uh, you will be illiterate and you will embrace uh, in the three years you have to live uh, whatever your parents teach you before you die of some hideous disease. Uh, when you are reborn in America, you are born with uh, a likelihood of 400 uh, diagnostic uh, mental disorders. You know the odds are pretty good. You know you'll if you're not a autistic, you know you'll be a narcissist or you know one thing or another. This world is the worst possible world for pro spiritual progress, and so um, this calls into questions: How can any major religion say? that God, this benevolent God, created us, somehow he's not responsible for genetic uh, disorders or, or chaos, accidents, uh, earthquakes, germs, it, nothing about our personality. He is not responsible for that, but he does use his magic wand to give us free will, and now we have to find out what the truth is, and if we don't find it, in our lifetime, we're going to be sent to hell. You know, the, the entire notion of embodiment of the major religions makes absolutely no sense at all. And everybody has just been thoroughly hypnotized for thousands of years. Uh, and the spirits are largely responsible for that. And uh, one can theorize, you know, what all that means. But I mean, it's the most absolutely incredible, obvious thing. This is the cosmic elephant in the room, and nobody but the Gnostics want to talk about this. I think you um, you hit on one of my favorite topics. You mentioned the spirits being responsible. Uh, <laughs> I am always, always talking to people as much as I can about, you know, what what are the nature of the spirits? I mean, is in a if you take the world, uh, you know, from a Gnostic point of view. The spirits are your enemies, right? I mean, you, this, it's uh, big in the occult community right now to have a, a spirit model, a spirit-centric model. And uh, there is a, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I can't understand how, how do you know which spirits you're talking to and which ones you, do you trust them and, and all that? Right. Uh, so my take on this is this. Um, this goes to the fundamental human dilemma, which is, how are you going to find out the truth? Mm -hmm. Now, I do think the truth is, in many respects, discernible. But this is not a world uh, that makes that very easy. I mean, you know, again, I could write a book on what I went through to get to this stuff. Now, um, First of all, to give you a couple of examples, growing up Mormon, uh, the Mormons believe that the angel Moroni came down and revealed uh, Mormonism. And in fact, the spirits are very active working for Mormonism. I can testify to that. And uh, for that matter, I believe Muhammad did have the Quran revealed to him. He was illiterate. Uh, he had to memorize what the angel Gabriel told him. Uh, anybody who can read Arabic will tell you that it's very eloquent. I don't think it was his product. The Virgin Mary, um, there's a great book by Scott Rogo called Miracles, where he shows there is really, really solid evidence for the Virgin Mary appearing, often with a little oval, shiny disc next to her, mysteriously enough. But um, yeah, a lot of atheists, I think it was 40,000 at Fatima, you know, a lot of people saw this thing. It wasn't anybody's imagination. Rogo actually has a photograph uh, from Zaytun in Egypt of the Virgin Mary appearing. Um, so the spirits are at work promoting um, things. Uh, Roman Catholicism in particular, uh, you know, how about all the saints, uh, the mm -hmm. hundred saints who never, uh, the incorruptibles, they never deteriorated, their bodies never deteriorated, things like that. Um, Catholics and Mormons have lots of miracles. I've interviewed experts in Hinduism, um, you know, they can tell you, you know, Krishna has appeared to them and all this stuff. So yes, they, uh, that's the negative side. On the other hand, um, I am a big believer in prayer and meditation and every day I go through what I call my prayer to the Holy Dead, starting with God, Jesus the Liberator, uh, my Mormon ancestors, 
uh, my mentors uh, throughout my life and career that I think would wish me well, and um, the uh, Gnostics uh, leaders that I most relate to, uh, people I've collaborated with uh, on various projects having to do with the supernatural who are no longer with us. And, you know, I ask for guidance. And uh, I have had a really incredible number of experiences that convinced me that I get help. But, uh, you know, the Gnostics said, we live in a dualistic world here. The powers of good and evil and the neutral spirits, the lost souls, uh, are fairly equally balanced. And you can get into theories as to why, but the Gnostics are the only ones that recognize that. And I'd like to just end with a mention that my wife, um, is a very experienced ritual ceremonial magician and she has had encounters with the spirits not all of them necessarily benevolent her teacher was once described by a famous psychic as a man of many colors you can interpret that as you wish so is he black or white many colors um, and uh, when she told her story for the first time uh, live um, at Ecclesia Gnostica a few weeks ago in celebration of Halloween, because she considers herself in the Wicca tradition, everybody there said it was pretty spine tingling. So yeah, there are evil spirits, and I would say the abduction phenomenon is evidence of that. Uh, anybody who thinks that, you know, get out the seance board and let's find out, you know, what God wants from us, uh, they don't know what they're playing with, and you do have to be careful, but there are good spirits, too, and I think we just have to do what we can to uh, tap into that and try to live lives worthy of their inspiration. Well, so many uh, uh, questions, uh, questions. Uh, <laughs> but we're unfortunately out of time, so... Uh, let us wrap uh, up there and let me uh, encourage, everybody uh, encourage everybody to go to godreconsidered.com and you can see you can Scott's see work there. Work there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Thank that's you so much for joining so much us. For joining and uh, it was a great conversation. Great and conversation. I, I look forward to yeah, doing it again someday. And just uh, feel free to censor anything that will <laughs> get you too much hate mail. No, we love hate mail. Any, any publicity is good publicity, right? <laughs> So the Demiurge says. <laughs> anyway, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, call me when you need me again. I, I work a weird schedule right now, but uh, I can usually make myself available. All right. Cool. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Scott. Bye, everybody. Bye.